In the 1990s, the two largest food companies in the world were R.J. Reynolds and uh, Philip Morris. What happened is when the Surgeon General way too late in the 1980s said cigarettes were maybe problematic, these were some of the largest companies in the world with the largest cash piles of any company in the world. So they, what they did is they used their cash piles to buy food companies. Uh, you know, we think about the 80s as the Wall Street era M&A, you know, a lot of deals. The two biggest M&A deals up until 1990 in world history were cigarette companies buying food companies. This wasn't just any corporate strategy. It was a calculated move by giants like R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris, who were facing growing public backlash and tighter regulations on tobacco. Philip Morris, for instance, acquired Kraft Foods in 1988 for $12.9 billion, and later bought Nabisco in 2000 for $14.9 billion, creating one of the world's largest food conglomerates. Similarly, R.J. Reynolds merged with Nabisco Brands in 1985. These acquisitions weren't about diversifying, they were about taking the addictive expertise from cigarettes and applying it to food. These companies brought their vast knowledge of addiction science directly into your kitchen, influencing the very fabric of the American diet. It wasn't just about expanding their portfolio. It was about applying the same addictive principles of nicotine to food products, thus ensuring that the same business model, creating lifelong consumers, remained profitable. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's listen to Cali. So you had in the 90s, these two cigarette companies very strategically do two things. They shifted their thousands of scientists who were experts at making cigarettes addictive to the food department. So we had the rise of ultra processed food where our food now is a science experiment. The second thing they did is they shifted their lobbying. So the cigarette industry, of course, was the biggest, you know, lobbying spenders and very had a good playbook. They shifted their playbook on lobbying and rigging institutions of trust to food. So they created the food pyramid. So the cigarette industry, through the food and companies they bought, paid off the FDA, the USDA, Harvard to create reports saying sugar doesn't cause obesity. And they lobbied for the food pyramid in the 1990s, we all remember which said, you know, animal-based fats are bad, carbs are good. Remember, carbs and sugar were basically the base of the pyramid. So the American diet, because of that, because we trust our medical institutions, which they know, uh, we shifted our diet significantly to ultra-processed food. How can we let this happen to them? About 18% of American teens now have fatty liver disease. That's like one out of every five. That disease, when I was a kid, only affected late stage alcoholics who were elderly. Cancer rates are skyrocketing in the young and the old. Young adult cancers are up 70, 79%. One in four American women is on antidepressant medication. 40% of teens have, a mental, teens have a mental health diagnosis. And 15% of high schoolers are on Adderall and half a million children on SSRIs. So what's causing this suffering? This episode, we'll talk about ultra-processed foods, how it affects us, our families, our loved ones. There's more than 100 chemicals added to these ultra-processed foods. This is legal, and it's affecting our health. We're going to look at the big categories of foods that we need to watch for. We're going to look at what we need to do to protect ourselves and our families. And in the end, we're going to talk about how the food industry is using neuroscience to lock these foods in permanently. So stay tuned. This is going to be a really in-depth episode. Now, for you that are new to my channel, I'm Dr. Richard Visser. I'm a former Minister of Health and Sports for my country. I have a PhD in Medical Sciences. My published research has been focused on childhood obesity, obesity, and chronic disease. I'm a doctor of chiropractic and a sports medicine trainer. Just for this, this part of my CV is important. There's more stuff, but I'm just mentioning this. So let's get started. We're going to start out by defining ultra processed foods or UPFs. Okay, these are products made largely from industrial ingredients. Like I said before, a hundred different chemicals are allowed in. Chemicals, additives, and they contain a minimum of whole food. So let's go over the most dangerous foods and their sources. 
Sugary beverages found in sodas, energy drinks, sweetened teas. Yes, even sweetened teas. Our kids love this stuff, right? High in sugar, artificial ingredients. What's their health impact? Well, they're linked to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and fatty liver disease. Second, packaged snacked foods, chips, crackers, and instant noodles, which I've been, yeah, I, I, I've dabbled in instant noodles. They're high in unhealthy fats, sodium, and preservatives, contributing to high blood pressure, heart disease, and insulin resistance. Processed meats, okay, the, the ones you buy to make sandwiches, hot dogs, sausages, bacon, and deli meats. Their health impact contains nitrites, preservatives, and high sodium. Strong link to cancer, especially colorectal cancer. And, of course, cardiovascular disease. Sugary cereals. Yes, the cereals that have the label, hey, we're healthy, you know, your kids can have us. Yeah, right. Marketed as healthy with whole grains, but loaded with sugar. Health impact, promotes insulin spikes, obesity, and metabolic syndrome. This is what we're feeding our kids. Frozen, ready-to-eat meals. Remember those? Five minutes, you don't have time, throw them in, boom. Okay, found in supermarkets. These are high in sodium, preservatives, and unhealthy fats. Health impact, contributes to hypertension, chronic inflammation, and weight gain. This is all going to metabolic disease, weight gain, type 2 diabetes, heart disease. This is what we're eating. This is our sources. This is our new food sources. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of people believe that the, some of these processed foods don't even look like processed foods. They believe they're healthy. So let's name a few. Let's, let's get the cat out of the bag. Grocery store bread, you know, the bread that lasts like over a week, whereas you buy bread from the baker, you got two days max. Yeah, marketed as whole grain or multigrain, but often made with refined flour and added sugars. Health impact causes blood sugar spikes, leading to insulin, insulin resistance over time. Next up, granola and energy bars. Energy bars. While marketed as healthy, these often contain high sugar levels, corn syrup, and palm oil. The health impact of this contributes to obesity and poor metabolic health. Flavored yogurts. Yeah, appears to be healthy, but is typically high in added sugars, artificial flavors. Health impact contributes to unhealthy blood sugar levels, especially in children. And they love these flavored yogurts, we think is the healthier option. Smoothies from chain stores, marketed as nutritious, but often filled with sugary juices, syrups. Add excess calories without fiber benefit or whole fruits, a major problem, okay? And then when we continue, we have to look at the impact on kids because kids are super susceptible to this, okay? Kids love this stuff skyrocketing obesity rates worldwide. One in five kids in the US are obese. You look at other countries like Turkey, Saudi, you name it, Mexico, everything. It's even higher, okay? Early exposure to ultra-processed foods, snacks, cereal, fast foods, compared to poor dietary habits early on. This is like the last thing you want your kids to touch. You wanna to keep it away as, as long as possible. Marketing, marketing to children is a tragedy. It's aggressive marketing of sugar and high caloric foods. Lack of nutritional education, of course. Schools and homes often fail to educate children about balanced whole food diets. Consequences, childhood obesity sets the stage for lifelong health issues, including type two diabetes, heart disease, mental health challenges, like depression, anxiety, and we're also going to talk about, you know, ADHD, ADD, uh, hyper kids. We need a call to action here. And we need to rethink school lunch programs. You know, we need to advocate for healthy meals at school, healthy availability, you know, get the sodas out, get the drinks out, banning limited 
you know, processed snacks and sugary drinks. Health education in school needs to be primary. Kids need to be moving in schools, okay? There's more movement, even during their classes. Community and family cha changes. Encourage families to cook at home using the whole ingredients. Support policies that make healthier foods options more affordable and more accessible. Food policy reform. Advocating for stricter regulations on marketing ultra-processed foods to children and more transparency on food labeling. This is basic stuff. This is basic stuff. Kids also need to move in school. So we need to move towards healthy schools. And there's a complete concept. I introduced it when I was Minister of Health in the schools in, in my country. And it's really already a preset thing where schools can start building healthy schools. And it's step by step. So they don't have to change the whole thing in one time. It's step by step. So really push uh, your school directors and your school boards to start implementing this. This will be the exclusive school. Not, you know, what we're doing now is paying a lot of money for these boutique schools and everything. They need to be implementing this. Okay. So what can we do? We have to empower through knowledge. We have to prioritize whole foods. We have to create healthy food environments. And that means access to foods. Don't bring bad foods in your house. Movement and physical activity need to be daily in school and outside of school. You need to look at the program your kids are following because they're spending eight hours at school. These eight hours are critical in learning about nutrition, in learning about movement and getting them ready to face all the, you know, all the stuff that's coming out in marketing. And marketing is massive to kids. And listen, kids, depending on what age they are, they don't know how to discern an ad from reality. So for them, it's all reality. And it's marketing so powerfully to them, uh, even in the grocery stores where, you know, the products are put at kids' levels height. I mean, kids are walking and they're seeing the products they want, the sugary products, the processed foods, everything. So these are a couple of things. And we're going to go deeper. We're going to go deeper into the food industry, okay? Because we need to look at some of these things that they're using. The chemicals and compounds in processed foods most commonly linked to ADHD and slower cognitive development in children. A riddle in. Riddle in, it's a joke. So, artificial food dyes, first one, okay, linked to ADHD. Studies suggest artificial dyes can increase hyperactivity and attention issues in children, particularly these already diagnosed with ADHD. Yes. Commonly found soda, sports drinks, energy drinks, uh, candies, uh, processed snacks, cereals. Some baked goods and desserts. Now, what are we talking about here? The two big ones, Red 40 and Yellow 5. Yellow 5 has been especially scrutinized for their link to hyperactivity in children. These are colorings that they use. Look at the coloring that's being used. Uh, so you got two here that are, that are known to cause problems. Red 40 and Yellow 5. Look for these. What else is linked to ADHD? Well, preservatives, sodium, benzoate, and nitrites, okay? Linked to ADHD and cognitive development issues. These are found, again, soft drinks, processed meats, packaged baked goods, pastries, high sugar, high fructose corn syrup, bad. And it's used because it's cheap. High fructose corn syrup, uh, comes from crops that are usually subsidized by government so they can get the sugar extremely inexpensive and they put them into these foods. Excessive sugar consumption, especially in children, has linked to poor cognitive performance, lower attention span, and hyperactivity. Common found, again, sweetened beverage, candy, cakes, pastries, sugar cereals, ketchups, and condiments. Trans fats, another one linked to cognitive decline. Trans fats 
being phased out in many regions are still present in some processed foods. These fats can affect the brain function and impair cognitive development in children. They're found in some dried foods like fast food fries, frozen meals, packaged snacks, microwave popcorn, cookies, cakes. Yes, the stuff we think, you know, is nice, is normal. Aspartame and other artificial sweeteners link to behavior on cognitive issues. Again, found in sugar-free snacks, Diet Coke, uh, diet soda, sorry, chewing gum, and, and mints. These compounds are often present in everyday foods marketed to children, exacerbating issues related to attention, learning, and overall cognitive growth. See how impactful this is. So in the teaser, I talked about how the food industry is using neuroscience to get to us and our kids. This is how they're doing it. The concept of hyper palatability refers to the deliberate engineering of processed foods to make them exceptionally appealing and difficult to resist. Food scientists combine specific combinations of sugars, fats, salts, along with texture enhancers and artificial flavorings to trigger reward centers in the brain. Here's how the science works. Activation of the brain reward system. Number one, processed foods are designed to activate the brain's dopamine reward system, which is the same mechanism involved in addictions. When we eat hyperpalatable foods, the brain releases large amounts of dopamine, creating feelings of pleasure and satisfaction. This leads to a bliss point. The precise ratio of sugar, fat, salts that makes the foods irresistible, encouraging overconsumption. Okay, so it's the feel, the taste, the crunchiness, the, the texture, the cream, everything that goes in there is science-based to trick our brains. Sugar's role in hyperpalatability. Sugar triggers an immediate dopamine release, giving the brain a quick surge of pleasure over time. However, regular consumption of sugary processed foods can desensitize the brain to dopamine, leading to a need for even more sugar to achieve the same feeling and satisfaction. This contributes to cravings and addiction eating patterns. High fructose corn syrup, we talked about this before, commonly found in processed foods has been shown to increase hunger and reduce feelings of fullness, further driving overconsumption. It tricks the brain. They are tricking the brain right? To overstimulate, to feel, to, to basically block the centers that tell you you're full, so you're overeating, getting overstimulated, and you need more of it every time. Sound familiar? Yeah, addiction. You're right. The role of fats. Fat adds richness and enhances the mouthfeel of food, creating a pleasurable sensory experience. In combination with sugar and salt, fat makes food feel more indulgent and satisfying. Fat is calorie dense, and when combined with sugar and salt, it leads to passive overeating, where people consume more calories without realizing it. Not a trick they're using. Salt's role, salt, enhance flavor and making foods more savory and satisfactory. It can mask undesirable tastes and make processed foods more appealing, driving people to eat more than they otherwise would. Salt also triggers the brain reward center and plays a role in cravings for soft, salty snacks. We've had that one. Once you you know, you go to a bar and you get these salty nuts and you want more, like chips, pretzels, and processed meats. Sensory overload and texture in the engineering. We're getting deep into this. The texture of processed foods is carefully engineered to maximize pleasure. Foods with a crunchy, crispy, or creamy texture are particularly appealing based, you know, based on what they create, an engaging 
eating experience. This is why snacks like chips, cookies are so addictive. They're designed to be consumed in large quantities. The combination of multiple sensory stimuli, including flavor, texture, aroma, creates a sensory overload that makes these foods irresistible. For example, you know, with a soft interior, fried foods provide a unique contrast that the brain finds highly rewarding. So they're studying what is highly rewarding to our brain in the texture of food, in the taste of food, and they're rewiring their formulas. Disruption of natural satiety cues. Satiety is like our feeling of fullness, our feeling of we've had enough. They're disrupting this, okay? So they're creating hyperpalatable foods to disrupt the body's natural satiety signals. So you eat more, you consume more. And imagine, I mean, this happens to us adults. Imagine with kids, the rapid consumption of calories, dense, you know, calorie dense processed foods often bypass the body's ability to recognize fullness, making it easier to overeat. Do you understand why we're in an obesity pandemic? worldwide with our kids the parents everyone and the new generations coming are actually set up to go to obesity to consume to get type 2 diabetes heart disease cancers and basically have a burden on our healthcare system a huge burden on our healthcare system from the get-go from the get-go because this is what's available everywhere you name it i you know you can walk, whatever, 100 feet and find a place or a machine or something that will sell you processed foods or sodas or anything canned, packaged. It's everywhere. It's convenient. It's cheap. It's right there. It's hyper palatable. And once you start eating that, fruits, regular fruits, regular vegetable, whole foods don't give you that high. It's like, I don't really like those foods. Just give me French fries. You know, I mean, it's an example, but I mean, this is where we're going. This is where we've gone. So it affects our long-term eating behavior. Processed foods disguised for maximum consumption. Yeah, the hyper palatable design of processed foods is a major driver of the current obesity pandemic particularly in children, as their developing brains are even more susceptible to these engineered food experiences. You know, it's like the gaming. It's like the iPad. It's like, you know, what the digital revolution has done with our kids. And, you know, of course, spurred on by the pandemic. This is what the food industry is doing to us. So we need to get a grip on this. We need to handle it. The first step is awareness. Second step is starting to read labels. Third step is protecting your children and families and knowing what steps to take, making sure their environments are the cleanest and best environments you can put them in. That means their schools. That means where you live. That means the home. Clean up your home. Get rid of all that sugary stuff. Once in a while is fine. They're not gonna die. Everyone's gonna have this. Everyone's gonna go to a birthday party. Everyone's gonna, everyone's doing that. But besides that, besides those occasions, keep them free of this because it ruins them. It doesn't only ruin their bodies, their health, but also their mind. That's it. Subscribe, ring the bell notification. Invites friends to follow. This is very important for the family. And remember, you know, my purpose here is to make you the healthiest you you've ever known. And also to make your family the healthiest family they've ever been. So thank you.